Hi, I'm Art Alonso. I'm Tina Geiler. My name is Paul Blake. My name is Nick Morgado. Captain with Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. Lieutenant from Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. Captain Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. Division Chief of the Training and Safety Division for Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. I'm a uh, cancer survivor. I have breast cancer. Battling stage four melanoma. And still fighting it. And I'm still fighting it. His fight with cancer. My father uh, was hired with Metropolitan Dade County in 1974. Uh, 1980, 1981, uh, my father went in for his uh, annual physical. Uh, shortly after that, he was diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Well, on May 16th, um, basically right before that, I just went for my regular yearly mammogram, um, which every woman should be doing. I had to do an MRI, and that's where they found the tumors in, in the breast, and that's how I found out I had breast cancer. I was diagnosed in 2010 uh, with multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a blood cancer, very much related to leukemia. I was uh, diagnosed in 2016 um, with what's called a metastatic melanoma. They had found multiple lesions in my lungs, and that pretty much started uh, my journey in battle with cancer. Average lifespan, once diagnosed with multiple myeloma, is three to five years. My kids were high school, middle, and, high, and elementary school. So I did the math, I'm like, I'm not gonna see my kids even graduate from high school. I take care of my mom, I take care of my grandparents. And my grandparents were in their 90s, late 90s, 99 and 94. You know, they depend on me. It's not just the person that's fighting the cancer, because they're not fighting it alone. Uh, the, the, enti the entire family's uh, involved and the entire family's affected. So when you have cancer, your family gets cancer. You know, the hardest part of uh, the cancer was really um, how I react to my kids because I was dealing with that stress of uh, being diagnosed. My temper was very short. He was given two options. One, he can do nothing and he'll uh, die within the year, or they can do extreme radiation treatment and you'll get leukemia 25 years from now. He went with the, uh, the radiation treatment, and it worked. He went into remission, uh, he came back to the job. In 2005, uh, he was diagnosed with mild dysplasia, uh, which is pre-leukemia. Uh, we sought treatment uh, aggressively, including what was a bone marrow transplant, and went in remission for two years. Uh, but in 2007, we had a, uh, we had a relapse. Uh, started seeking chemotherapy again. Unfortunately, uh, he caught pneumonia, and on April 18th, a day before his 58th birthday, uh, he lost his fight. My father lived his life with an expiration date or a timeline. During chemo, um, you have a port, which is right here on me, and, um, you know, they stick a needle in your port, and I pretty much sit there for about eight to 12 hours. I've never had to deal with anything like this in my life, and. The symptoms you get with it, uh, you're just sick every day. You're in pain every day. Um, and it's not something that I, I can articulate. It's, um, it's just brutal on the body. I've had some very bad days, you know. Uh, you know, chemotherapy is it's a toxin. It's, it's designed to kill cells, but it doesn't discriminate. It kills good cells as well, so you, know, you lose your hair. The second I walk in, even before the first needle prick, I get nauseous. It's a mental game that chemo patients have to face. I do chemo twice a week for three weeks in a row. Every fourth week I'm off and uh, this will continue until I decide uh, and I'm ready for my next stem cell transplant. I had brain surgery. After I had the brain surgery, uh, I was able to start uh, brain radiation. And after the brain radiation, I was then uh, able to take part in immunotherapy. When I received my treatments, I was hospitalized for several months and dropped a significant I'm not a big guy as it is. I dropped a significant amount of weight and just the recovery process of getting my strength back. But I can't look at all the things and the setbacks. I have to look at all the positive things. That's the love of the organization. This, this thing that we have, this brotherhood, this sisterhood is absolutely phenomenal. In my time, when I first came on in the late 80s, you never saw anybody with a self-contained. It was like, you know, it's not manly. We do things the, the old school method. And I've learned that that could have been part of uh, where I'm at today. The culture was so different when I first got on. And, 
you know, these guys that I was working with never even wore the rest of you. They would tell you stories and, you know, how cool it was to get, you know, when you go into your, to the fire and you're, you get your helmet all dirty. You don't ever clean the helmet. None of the guys clean the helmet. They wanted to keep those dirty. We actually found that the genes that are responsible for controlling cancer get down-regulated or don't work as well when you have uh, long-term uh, chemical exposures over the life course of that firefighter. The priority was getting back to the station, maybe taking some water and soap from the, uh, from the sink, cleaning out the face, maybe the neck, getting a couple trifold towels, wiping it off, and that was it. If the fire was after midnight, I gotta be honest with you. My goal was to get back into bed. Why do I wanna take a shower at the station? I'm gonna be getting up in a couple of hours. If I make it to 0700, just taking a shower when I get home. It was commonplace, particularly for overhaul. You wore your pack for the fire, but for overhaul, you dress down, you go in and do overhaul. You know, you're lucky if you're wearing bulking pants and a helmet. An example is your regular mundane routine calls, a kitchen fire, a structural fire. Um, those may not have large bursts of chemical exposures, but over the life course of the, of the firefighter, those short bursts of exposures actually contribute to affecting the DNA and the expression of the types of cancers that we see in our firefighters. It only takes a little minute piece of that soot to cause cancer. And over 19 years, how many little kind of pieces did I breathe in? I can't tell you how many times I know that I would later on, you know, wipe your nose, sneeze, cough, and you can see the soot coming out of napkins. And you know, you thought you'd look back, how much of that got into my lungs? How much of that got into my, into my bloodstream? We worked on a study that looked at uh, what types of exposures firefighters that are operating in the warm zone have. And based on that, we were able to detect that there's different types of noxious and hazardous um, gases that were, that were present in the warm zone during a regular uh, fire incident response. What I would tell my brothers and sisters today in a fire service is that, you know, treat, treat firefighting like you do uh, hazmat. You know, it's, it's an unknown danger that you're going to walk into every day. What you don't see, what you don't hear, what you don't taste could very well kill you. We're never going to get out of the fact that, that we are in a very hazardous occupation. There are going to be incidental occurrences where we get exposed to smoke. That's just a part of the job. You can't get around that. But there are things that we can do to minimize our exposure and risk. We need to change the way that we do business. Not at the cost of delivering the service to the public that we serve, but we can find better ways to provide the same level of service, reducing the risks and hazards to us. And it's going to change, and it has to come with the change the way that we operate it, through innovativeness, through trying new methods and ways, and figuring out what's going to be the best fit for us now, and also moving into the future. Definitely wear all your gear, your hood, your gloves, even during overhaul. Um, you don't want that stuff on your skin and get it absorbed in your skin, because that will also cause cancer. Um, you guys don't want cancer, wear your gear, your full gear, all the time, and make sure you clean it afterwards. Exercise strong decontamination practices. Don't put your bunker gear or your turnout gear in the back of your car aerating itself. Put it in a, in a closed uh, container so that gas is not fuming into your car and affecting your loved ones or yourself. We need to decon our gear. There's a reason for it. Research has shown that the off-gassing is crucial. Uh, the bathing, you know, you have the wipes for the scene. You know, you have the wipes, you can use it on your neck, all exposed skin surfaces. Changing the way we do business, whether it be through, you know, gross decon, cleaning our gear, swapping out our gears, changing our gloves, changing our hoods, uh, doing our medical physicals, all those things tie into that. I'm not saying that in itself, doing the gross decon and the hood swap and the showers aren't in itself I mean, to stop cancer, but at least you can sleep at night saying that, you know what, I took those contaminants off of my skin right off the bat and thus lessen my chance of getting this type of cancer. We can't turn a blind eye to it. We, we know that it exists and there are certain things, easy things that we can do that are going to reduce our risk.